What's up, y'all? It's your girl Sang, and today we're going to be reacting to a video from PragerU. It says Stories of Us, Amala Ekpunobi, but the thumbnail says Why I Quit My Job as a Leftist Organizer. Now, I don't know who this is, but that sounds very interesting, and I'm definitely, we, you know what, we're going to get into this together. They hated white people. I'm half white. Am I supposed to hate that half of myself? Am I supposed to hate my family? That was a light bulb moment for me. My name is Amala Evanoe, and this is my story. Like, I'm 20 years old. I was born in Florida, and I'm a social media influencer and Prager Force member. So my father was a Nigerian immigrant. He moved to America. He met my mother. They fell in love and got married and they had three children, me being the middle child. And he was in my life up until I was six years old. And then my parents got divorced. So I have very little memories of him as a child. And as they were divorced, I didn't see him very often, maybe every year or so. And Ooh, now he up. bears very little influence in my life, which I know is common for most people in the black community, unfortunately. So I sort of fall into that statistic, if you will. Oh, that's sad. So my mom is a very strong-willed woman, a very opinionated woman. She happens to work for the left. She is a fundraiser, so she gets all the funding for the organization that she works for. As a child, my mom's beliefs were ingrained in me. She taught me leftist ideology and, and what she believed from a very young age. And I was always well aware of where she fell on the line and expected to believe the same. Not having my father in my life did have an impact on me, but I found father figures elsewhere. And two people who had a major influence on me were my grandparents. And they are this strong, beautiful, conservative couple that has been married for years and years. and. They taught me how to be a lady. They taught me how to carry myself and be mature. And I find myself very lucky, actually, that even though my family does not agree with the values that I am putting out to the world, that my family accepts what I do and that they are proud of what I do, even though they disagree. When I was 17. That's cool. That's how it should be. Like, we all don't have to agree with each other. But I just hate it when there's like some families that would just straight up disown you just because your political views are different. Like, you're not a murderer, you're not an arpist, you're not a pedo. Like, I don't understand where the disownment comes in at, you know? But good good for her family for still being there for her despite, despite those differences. And then I graduated high school, I took up a job as a youth organizer at my mother's organization. Also, okay, so the dad was from Nigeria and then he was no longer in the life, blah, blah, blah. So I'm assuming her conservative grandparents has to be from the mom's side, so because the mom's white. I'm assuming, she didn't really get into that, but I'm assuming. Um, if that's the case, I wonder how the mom turned out with leftist ideologies. Which is interesting, because now you come to the daughter, which is like the grandchild, and now she's back to the, to the um, conservative ideologies. And as I was working there, I remember in particular walking into the office and hearing these conversations specifically in regards to white people, and it was blatantly racist. There was no way around it. There was no beating around the bush. They hated white people. And I sat down with the VP of the organization, and I told him I was concerned. I'm half white. I grew up with my white family. Am I supposed to hate that half of myself? Am I supposed to hate my family? He essentially told me, you have to understand that people are angry and they're rightfully angry and they're going to say these things and maybe they don't fully mean it, but you have to sit down and you have to take it and you should be angry too. So that was a light bulb moment for me. And why should she be angry too? She's literally telling you she's concerned because she's not angry and she thinks that's messed up. It's like, you need to sit there and, and be angry too. Why though? Why? That, that doesn't, as a boss, that's not a satisfactory response. I went out to seek answers on my own since nobody wanted to answer them. I went online and I found an interview in particular uh, of Thomas Sowell. And something that resonated with me is that 
He was a Marxist for most of his young life, just as I was. And that shared experience was a beautiful revelation to see. And now he is this beautiful mind who has intellect beyond what I will ever be capable of. So he is a major inspiration for me and a big part of why I'm a conservative today. Yeah, Thomas Sowell, um, he was talked about a lot in the Uncle Tom documentary. So if you guys ever get a chance, if you've never seen it, I highly recommend watching it. It's kind of long, um, but then again, we could sit down and binge watch a full Netflix show in like one or two days and we consume all the episodes. So if you can do that, you can watch this documentary. I think it's like two hours long or something. I'm, there's two parts to it too. So you got Uncle Tom and then you got Uncle Tom 2. I didn't watch the second one yet, but I watched the first one. Highly recommend watching that documentary. It's right here on YouTube and it's free. So when I think about the black community in America and how we are taught to be victims, it is devastating for me. And what happens is you are raised in a society in which really nobody is treating you differently, but you have the mindset that they are. And not only does it hold you back from creating your own success, but it holds you back from taking accountability and you no longer are responsible for your actions because you have somebody to blame. Facts. And Facts. people perpetuate that and they tell you that's okay and they say, yes, you are a victim. And then no, you go out not. with that mindset. And when success doesn't happen for you, you blame it on other people. And ultimately, I think that is the main problem with that narrative is that there's no accountability in the black community anymore. And people get very, very angry when you say things like that. Yeah, they do. Funny enough, me and my brother just had this conversation yesterday where we were talking about that. Um, yeah, a, a lot of a lot of black people, if you try to even bring up the accountability factor, they'll, they'll get so mad and you'll get called everything in the book. And, you know, th there's like another thing too, where I, I just, I just hate the, how, how do I explain this? How do I explain this? E even if you tell somebody, like, you need to take accountability, they're going to look for fault in everything where it's down to, like, not only is stuff racist, right? But colorism also runs through our community as well. I've experienced it numerous times. I could be riding super hard, right, for my black brothers and sisters. And they'll look at me and be like, well, what do you know about um, police discrimination and all this other stuff? You're mixed. I'm still black at the end of the day. Like, you act like I've never been um, called the N-word. You act like I've never been, like, messed with the police for no reason. And that's, that's what it ends up all comes down to. Like, I remember at my last job, uh, a lot of black people was just like, oh, oh, this, this place is so racist. You notice how there's no black people in the management positions? And I'm looking right at them and I'm like, me, the girl that works the... Um, other side of the week on this shift, we both ran that department. We were both black females. Mind you, yeah, I'm light skinned, but she was full on, she looked African. She about as, as black as, well, she, she wasn't that black, but way darker than me, where if you looked at her, you, you wouldn't be pulling that colorism BS that you were trying to play on me. My bosses that came in, I had a black female boss and they, and I remember them sitting there one day just telling me, they was just like, ain't nobody in color here. And I'm just like, I run a whole department. What are you talking about? I'm black. And I started naming off all these things. Despite me naming other black people in management positions throughout the whole company, and that was their skin color, not mine, they looked at me and was like, man, we can see why you got in. I'm like, what does that mean? It's like, we could tell. It's like, no, I got in because I was the top performer in my area. That's why I got in. It ain't got nothing to do with anything else. Because <laughs> if that was the case, okay, there was people of their skin color in the same area, crappy workers, right? If that's the case, we just pulling anybody. So that means if I was a crappy worker, they would have just pulled me. There was people that was white that was crappy uh, workers. Why they ain't pull them? Why did I get pulled in? Because I was the top worker. There's no accountability for how you are as a worker or, or, or for life, period. And I, I really hate it. I really do hate it.
because they want their race to be seen. They think it's such a pivotal part of who they are as a person. And it's overtaking character. It's overtaking morals and values. It's overtaking where you even land politically. Your race is seen as this sort of pivotal structure to who you are when that should not be the case. We are bringing back segregation in this country and people will sell it to you as if we're doing it in a positive manner, but it is segregation nonetheless and that is never positive. So that's another narrative that the American people are being sold that we need to uplift black people and in doing that we need to keep them in their separate categories and we, we need to give them their success. And it perpetuates the very same racist narrative that they are trying to run away from. Because if black people can't do anything without your help and without the help of white liberals or white leftists, what are you saying about the black community? You're saying that they're not capable of doing things without you. You're taking away their character. You're taking away their success and putting it under your name. We are seeing exactly. this positive segregation in the black only college dorms. We're seeing it in affirmative action. We're seeing it in our streaming services like Netflix and Hulu where we have black only categories. I went onto YouTube the other day and I got a big poster that said, let's uplift black creators. And here's a list of black creators on our platform. We are segregating virtually every single facet of our society and we're doing it in this gradual process and teaching people that it's a positive aspect of our lives when it's not. I agree with her, especially on the YouTube aspect because Corey Kenshin, he just did a video what was it? It's like two or three weeks ago now, where he was talking about how YouTube, um, I forgot what it was. They they age restricted one of his videos, and when he called them out on it, it was all this BS going on. And he mentioned in that video, he was like, "If you really cared about black creators, you would post us more without making it seem like like a big thing. Like they have the uh, the black YouTube space or whatever." He was like, "Why do we need our own space?" Like, why not just push us like you push everybody else? Like, there should be no color. It's like, if we're doing good, just push it. It shouldn't be anything like this. And I agree with everything she's saying. Like, that, it, that is a thing. It, it's like we're trying to be a special class. And, and don't get me wrong. I understand, like, with slavery and systematic racism and all that. And I know for a lot of us, that was like our grandparents. So... We're not that super far removed from it, but we're also far enough removed where, like, it's 2022. I guess where I'm trying to get at is that, like, anybody could do anything at this point. Anybody can get rich. Anybody can make it. It is what it is. And, I, and there's no accountability. There's always excuses. And it's really annoying. That That's basically, in a nutshell, where I'm getting at. And it, I, but I agree with everything she's saying though, because Corey Kenshin called it out too in his video to YouTube. The left is very, very supportive of anti-American values and anti-American speech. And they see it as taking back a country that has not served them, even though America has done wonders for everybody who lives here. I fear that if things continue on the same track that they're on right now, we are going to lose all sight of what America ever was or what America should be. And there are strong campaigns to strip America of its tradition and of its values. And a lot of it Facts. is what we are taught. When we go into school, we are taught that this country of freedom and liberty has all these transgressions that nobody wants to talk about and nobody wants to discuss. And really, we have a systemic issue that we really are not the, the free and tolerant country that we preach to people that we are. We are not the beacon on the hill that we try to get other people to perceive us as. And I think it is just a child that is born of misinformation and lies. I think that we can yeah. all find common ground in looking at the beautiful things that this country has to offer. We get to experience more freedom than anybody in the world. The fact that I can go out and have freedom of speech and say what I feel and what I think, it's also amazing in this country that we can come here <laughs> and enjoy all these opportunities, create businesses, create our own world, create our own dream, and, and to know that you can go out and be whatever you want to be is a beautiful thing that should absolutely be celebrated on both sides. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. That was a good video. I've never seen her stuff before, but I'm gonna have to check it out. She's from PragerU. If you don't know, that's on uh, Daily Wire. Just let y'all know, man. One of my goals is to build this up so I could be on PragerU. Like, I, I want my own show on Daily Wire.
That is the goal. If we can get there, we we woo, we gonna be good, boy. We gonna be good. Look, y'all remember how Matt Walsh started out? He was doing everything in his car, and now he like he moved on to like. Well, he was like in a room, then he had like a small set. Now he got that nice set that he working on. Look, if it just got to be this every day, like I'll fix the background. Like I, all this, I, I'll put some better stuff up in my house. I'll fix it, right? I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever. But we can we can get to that point where like Ben Shapiro hits me up and he's like, hey, I like your stuff. Would you like to be? Yes. Yes, that is the goal. That's we going to, we got to hit this first to, to move up, whatever. We, we ought to make it happen, but anyway, if you want to see me to react to more videos like this, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell because I drop videos every single day. I try to do two to three every day. If I don't, I'll let you know on my social media and the links to that is in the description box below. So until next time, you already know who it is. It's Sang. Yeah,